Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming here today. We've got a, a great presentation ready for you guys. We have Mr. Jason Wong from Singapore, welcoming him to Australia and to Geelong specifically today. And uh, we just uh, wish you all, all of the best, Mr. Wong, in your presentations over the country. And uh, we're really looking forward to seeing what you've got for us today. So if you'd just like to come up here and Give us a little bit of an introduction about yourself and then we can get started. Thank you. Good day everyone, thank you for having me here. Flew seven hours this morning. Must thank Bill for fetching me from the airport. Um, 30 years ago, I was here, but uh, in Perth, I spent four years here. And uh, this time, I, when I was invited to come back, I thought I should and I must because I benefited a lot from Australia. Um, I found God here 30 years ago. And as you can see from this verse, I took you from the ends of the earth, from his father's corners, I called you. I went to Christian mission schools in Singapore, but never became a Christian. But God used to take me out from Singapore and brought me to Australia. And when I came here, of course, I was doing my university 30 years ago. Spent four years in Perth, UWA, University of Western Australia. And that scholarship was actually funded by the Australian government under the Colombo Plan, the Commonwealth Nations. So we were one of the beneficiaries, and that is why I owe Australia so much. And um, in fact, oh, that's my family. And for those of you who do not know, I found my wife here too, wow. 30 years ago. <laughs> so I found God. I got a scholarship from Australian government and I found my wife who actually stayed only 10 minutes walk from me back in Singapore. And of course, um, I have two lovely children now. My daughter is 18 years old. She may come to Australia to study next year or this year. She just finished her A-levels, her high school. And that's my son. Um, my career, since I went back to uh, Singapore after graduating, spent uh, the last uh, over 20 over years i spent 17 years in the prisons that's why you see the people in uniform in blue i was a prison officer i don't look like one but i was i am uh, in, okay for 17 years um, and for six years after that i um, went to another government department and I was involved in initiating another national movement called the Deaths for Life. So I will spend the next uh, 45 minutes, one hour, and share what God has done through me. But uh, I must say that uh, you know, last year in August, I went to Perth. Uh, so this year I'm traveling to uh, Geelong, Melbourne, Canberra, as well as Adelaide. And I remember when I was in Perth last year, I spoke to one church leader. And I told him, I looked him in the eyes and I said, I must thank you and I would like you to receive it on behalf of Australia because I benefited so much. I would not have been where I am if not for Australia. So my flying back this time round again is to pay back, to return to you what you have blessed me. And uh, I must say that uh, there are many overseas students over the years that have come here for two years, for three years, for four years, and many of them have become Christians. And as a result, we have gone back to our own nation. We have brought, brought back the blessings. We have brought back God. We have brought back a lot of good stuff back to Singapore. And as you hear me, you will realize that uh, through one life, what God has done through me, one life. Can you imagine the many thousands that have gone back to the different parts of Asia? You have been a blessing. So now let me share with you um, you know, one thing, God has always a solution. Whenever he allows us to see a problem, and I'm sure there are many social problems in the, every nation, whenever he allows us to see a problem, he already has the solution. question is whether we can hear his solution, whether we can see his solution. You know, in Exodus 3, verse 7, and 10, 7 to 10, the Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out because of the slave drivers, I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them. It's interesting, you know, this is the story of Moses encountering God in the fiery bush. He was doing his own business, he was minding his own business, but then he saw the fire burning in the bush and he was drawn to God. And it was holy ground and God spoke. 
Not very often we are minding our own business, but God will speak to us and in a way that will change our lives, in a way that will transform our lives. And it's interesting, before God told Moses to do something, God actually revealed his heart. What did God say? I've seen the misery of my people. I've heard them crying out. I'm concerned about them. So God sees, God hears, God feels. And the best thing is, I come down to rescue. So if God looked down in your nation, in your city, in my nation, God sees the problems. God sees the issues. Sometimes we don't have the problems. Uh, we don't have the solution. We don't know what to do. But God has a solution. And He will come down. I remember when I was working in the prisons, I see all the prisoners, the population was going up every year. It was going up by three, four hundred. It was a growing business. <laughs> Not a very good growing business. A business to grow in, but it was. Because why is a prison growing in its business? That means there are issues out there in society. That means there are drug problems. That means there are family problems. That means there's dysfunctionality. And uh, so, of course, my, my job was very secure, but I went to the Lord and I asked God, you see all this, what do you want to do? And when I read this verse at the time, God thumbs down. But interestingly, if we read verse 10, you know what God told Moses? So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh. <laughs> You know, we think that God will come down personally and we don't have to do anything, just watch him do his work. We just enjoy the miracles, but God can't do it without us. God wants to go into the prisons. God wants to go into every corner of society to solve the problems. But God cannot go unless we bring him there. You know, on Sunday, when we go to church, we receive the word, we receive the anointing, we receive the power. On Monday, we have to bring that to our workplace, bring that to our market, bring back, bring that to the society and solve all those problems. I uh, did not start off as a prison officer when I went back because I did economics, so I started off as a Ministry of Finance, but after one year I just felt led that I should go to a place that uh, God can use me. Uh, and interestingly, the department I was working in in Ministry of Finance was corporatized, so we were given a chance to go wherever we want, wherever we wanted, and I opened up the newspapers and I saw there was an advertisement they were looking for people with zeal of a missionary to work in the prisons. So I thought, wow, you know, I have the zeal of a missionary. So I decided to work in the prisons. I went, I was interviewed and I was selected. In fact, they were very happy because I was the only overseas scholar that wanted to go into the prisons to work. In those days, even the local scholars, those who studied in Singapore, who are scholars, wanted to get out of the prisons because they, it was like a dead end. There's no career prospects. You know, nobody wanted to join the prisons. I remember I told my mother, I said, I wanted to join the prisons as a prison officer. My mom said, you sure? Remember there was a riot that took place? Of course, I didn't remember, but I was too young for it. And there was a riot on a prison island because this group of uh, gangsters was so uh, badly behaved. They were gang leaders. They have to put them on a prison island. And within three, four years, there was a riot that took place. The dormitories were burned. The superintendent called Daniel Dutton. They through patrol, kerosene, they opened up the roof and they threw it in and he was burned charcoal black. After I joined the prison service, I have access to those photos, I could see it was really bad. And there were three, four prison officers that were murdered, that were killed. Um, a number of these prisoners were hanged in the end. Of course, my mom remembered this incident and she was really worried about me, <laughs> thinking that I would be beaten up, you know. I was as slim then as now. <laughs> so if I take out this jacket, I, I really do not look like a prison officer. But I told my mom, I really want to go there. And of course, with fear and trembling. God, is this where you want me to be? You know, because Peter, before he stepped out of the boat, which was a very safe place, he walked on water. But he didn't say, God, I think if you let me, I can walk on water. But because Jesus was walking on water and Jesus called out to him and said, come. And as a result of that word, that audible word from Jesus, that rhema word, so he stepped out. So I needed that rhema word. And thank God, whenever we seek, God will give us his word. Whenever we seek with all our heart, he will reveal his plans. In Jeremiah 29, that's what God said. So I did, I sought the Lord. By then I was already working in the prisons for three weeks or four weeks. And uh, I decided wow, I really like this, but there were opposition. Different people were telling me different things. My mom said, you know, you won't make it. My future father-in-law at the time, I wasn't married yet. My wife's, uh, uh, my girlfriend then, uh, father said, you're too honest. You know, all these drug addicts, they will tell lies, you won't make it. And uh, so different people were telling me, were discouraging me, but I felt that 
this is where God wanted me to be. And as I saw the Lord, God gave me a dream. And let me share with you briefly what this dream about. I was walking. I still remember. Now, each time I share it, it's very vivid. I, I, could, I, I could still see it. I was walking amongst uh, 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 the, the, the roads, and I, there were lots of rubbish up to my knee level. Everywhere I walked, it was... Just, and I remember, only I could see it. The people around me could not see it. In the dream, I still remember I was talking to myself. I said, how come all these people, they didn't notice the rubbish? But I saw it. I still remember this scene where I walked into a, a coffee house. It was air-conditioned. People were drinking co coffee, chit-chatting uh, 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 in twos and threes. And I looked down, there was so much rubbish. And they didn't no notice. I remember when I came out, I saw across the road an old lady was sweeping the side of the pave pavement. And I remember I, I told myself in the dream, I said, there's just too much rubbish. It's impossible uh, to, to, to clean up. Next day, I woke up. I was actually in a church camp for the leaders of the church. I was one of the leaders of the church and uh, the pastor uh, uh, started to worship. And about the third or fourth song, I was worshiping, my eyes were closed, my hands were raised, and the song was give thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One. Let the weak say I'm strong, let the poor say I'm rich. When it came to this part, the dream came back. I remember I started talking to God, there were about 70 of us. Nobody knew what was happening in my head, but I saw the dream. And I was talking to God. I said, God, I remember this dream. You, this was last night. All the rubbish. And I remember asking God, what do you want me? What does it mean? What do you want me to do? And I saw three words being typed out. You know, in those days, 30 years ago, 20 over years ago, we had dot matrix printer. If you are old enough like me, you will remember dot matrix printer. How does it sound like? How does dot matrix printer sound like? It goes... Very loud, very loud, you know. Nowadays, laser printer, you cannot even hear it being printed out. Da, 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 da. I could hear it in my head. I saw these three words being typed out from the right moving to the center, stopped right in front of me, and the three words were trash of society. My eyes were closed. I saw these three words. Before I could finish asking God, what does it mean? The understanding came through my whole being and heard God say, for the rest of your life, are you willing to walk amongst the trash of society? People will not see it, but you will see it every day. And with that, I remember my tears were flowing. There were 70 people around me. They didn't know God was speaking to me. My hands were raised. I was just worshipping God. I said, I'm willing, I'm willing. If that's what my life is all about, so be it. From that day onwards, when I went back to my workplace, when I walked back into the prison every Monday, it's very different. I no longer look at it as a job. I look at it as a mission field. This is where God wants me to be. In Luke 4, he said he will set prisoners free. Not the prison's department setting prisoners free. Not the prison officers. God will set prisoners free. But he need us, he need the Christians to walk with him every day in the prisons and, and receiving solutions. And that was what happened. Of course, along the way, I, I had opportunities to set prisoners free. Uh, I still remember uh, uh, walking with one prisoner because he has uh, HIV. He was diagnosed in those days actually uh, we do not have a lot of information about HIV, AIDS, you know, so people avoided him, the prisoners avoided him, so he was kept alone. Um, but I was on duty every day. Whenever I was on, on duty, I walk around the prison as a duty officer, I will walk with him because God is in me. There's no need to fear. And I will minister to him. We will walk back and forth in the small little area that, that, that he has access to. And uh, I remember one day he told me, he said, Sir, I had nightmares. The last few nights I had terrible nightmares. It's all this, I feel so, these evil things, you know. Uh, uh, I can see shadows in myself. And because he has this HIV, AIDS, and uh, uh, nobody there to sleep with him. So he was put alone in the cell. And, and at least for us, we have nightmares. We can walk out of a house or go <laughs> outside to take a walk. But for him, he cannot get out of the cell. So it was very, very uh, uh, um, traumatic for him. So as he told me, I began to tell him, you know, do you have a religion? Do you have God? And he said, no. I said, why don't you try Jesus? Why don't you try? I said, Jesus, I heard of Jesus. I said, Jesus can, can, uh, can, can, can set you free. Jesus can, can send all these evil spirits and shadows, dark shadows away. You just call upon the name of Jesus. And he said, okay. I remember the next day when I went back to see him, he was walking, he was smiling at me. So I walked up to him and we started to walk back and forth because that was his exercise every day. And he said, sir, last night when I saw the, the shadows I started calling upon this name called Jesus. Then I looked at him, I said, so what happened? He said, the shadows disappeared, no more. I had a peaceful sleep. And the next thing I asked him is, do you want to receive Jesus into your life? Do you want to be a Christian? He said, 
Yes. So I said a sinner's prayer with him and offered to uh, introduce a counsellor from a prison fellowship. And he took it up and from that day on, he had Christian counselling. And uh, So setting prisoners free, there were many opportunities. But I believe when God says he wants to set prisoners free, it's not just about prisoners. It's about the whole prisons, the, the, the space, that, that, that correction service. And what this was what happened. After some years, um, with sufficient Christians coming in, we decided that we need a vision. We, we can't just be locking people up. We can't just be having prisoners coming in. We just do our job day in, day out. But can we ha have a vision, uh, an exciting vision? And of course, for those of us who are Christians, we are looking at a vision that can set prisoners free. So finally, we came up. A lot of the Christians were involved in crafting this vision. Of course, in a secular uh, uh, space, we can't use the word Bible, we can't use God, we can't use Jesus, but we use kingdom principles, kingdom values. And finally, we crafted this. We aspire to be captains in the lives of offenders, committed to our custody, you know, captains of lives. We used to be called custodians of, and we wanted to be a world-class prisons, you know. In, at that time, hardly anybody wanted to join prisons but we have this vision. We believe that we will be a world-class prison system. In fact, the prison officers who were Christians, we believe that God will make us into a world-class because only when we are a world-class exemplary prison system, we can set prisoners free, not just lock prisoners up. So as a result, because of the new vision, from custodians, from captors of lives, we became captains of lives. Just by having the word change, I guess like full gospel, just by having the word change, from full gospel business, you know, uh, 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 you change to gatekeepers. Just by having that word change, your whole persona will change, your whole philosophy will change. So from captains of lives, we became captains of lives. 2,000 over staff were overnight became captains of lives. We are not just here to lock people up, but we are here to set them free. And in fact, it's not just about the culture, the vision, the values, but also infrastructure. I was, from building prisons to lock prisoners up, we began to build some of the new prisons to set prisoners free. What does it mean? In the olden days when we built prisons, it's make sure nobody escaped. Make sure minimize riots. Lots of CCTVs, iron bars, etc., etc. But then we decided that it's not good enough because when they are released, they will come back again. <laughs> they are not changed. So we decided we need to build an infrastructure that can help to set them free. What does it mean? That means, uh, okay, this was what had happened. Let me share with you. I was involved as the director of this project in charge of the prison rebuilding program. As I was telling you earlier, the prison population was on the in increase. Every year was three, 400 added on. So when I first joined, it was 12,000 over. It reached a peak of 18,000. We were on our way to 23,000 projection. <laughs> and uh, so at its peak, 18,000, it was overcrowded. We, were, we have no choice but to plan for 23,000 within 10 years. I was put in charge of this project. We went different parts of the world. We came to Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, US. We learned the best design, the latest design. I still remember at the end of the study trip, the architect that was with us, he was presenting on the, uh, uh, this was a conference room, something like that, and I was uh, chairing the, the, the meeting, and he, he had this master plan, 20 new prisons. Five prisons, one cluster. One cluster, two cluster, three cluster, four cluster. Each cluster, five prisons. Twenty new ones. We would we, we will tear down all the old ones and bring everybody together at this new complex, and it will be the largest. You know, I still remember the architect as he was presenting. He said, "You know, Singapore has the largest airport. We have the largest seaport. We're going to have the largest prison complex <laughs> in the world." You know, I was chairing that meeting. I was so proud, and I said, "Wow!" You know, yes. And of course, and he said, "You know, in time." This will be one of the, the best design, the latest design, and people from all over the world will come and learn from you. You know, the different, the correction services will come and learn from you. So I sat there, so I was pretty proud, and all of a sudden I heard a voice from God. And I heard God say, why are you so proud, Jason? I, I, so I started having this conversation while the meeting was still going on. I was just having this conversation with God. And I said, God, why not? I mean, you called me to join the prisons, and now I'm in charge of this project, and we're going to build this, you know? And, uh, and that was when I heard God say, don't you know this is a place that Satan used to keep people in bondage? I remember my chair has wheels. I pushed myself from the conference room table. <laughs> I folded my arms. 
I said, oh dear, I'm not going to have anything to do with Satan's project to lock up the largest prison population in the world. And I went home that day for a few, I can't remember, two weeks, three weeks. I was on my knees asking God, is it time for me to resign and, and, and maybe join, join church? Or, you know, uh, maybe that's the end of my marketplace work. But there was one day at the end of that two, three weeks, I was pressing in in my, in, in my room, pressing. I said, God, what do you want me to do? And then I heard God came through and God said, the very place that Satan used to keep people in bondage, I'm going to take it back. I'm going to use it to set prisoners free. With that word, with, with that voice, I went back to office the next day, sat down with the architect, sat down with the project team and said, okay, we have enough CCTVs, we have enough iron bars, we have enough cells, you know, we have all this, but what do we need in order to set them free? What spaces, what, what programs that can fit into those spaces? Is it more workshops? Is it more vocational training? Is it more counseling rooms? Is it more family reconciliation spaces? And we began to put some of this in place. Same prison, secure, but now it became one that is not just secure, but one that is able to support rehabilitation and reintegration. And that was how uh, it happened. So from setting prisoners free to setting the whole prison system free, the prison infrastructure free, to setting society free. Because we managed to change a lot of things inside the prison, but we realized that when the prisoners walk out of the prisons, they walk into a second prison because society is not willing to accept them. Society is still stigmatizing them. Society is not willing to forgive them. And, and I was, this time I was in charge of a project to help reintegrate them. I still remember because I was moved from the prisons. By then, I was the number three, number two of the prison service. There were 2,000 over staff. I was moved to a statutory board that worked closely with prisons to help prisoners uh, uh, get skilled, get training, and also help them to find jobs. So I was in charge of this statutory board. And I still remember, it was so difficult to help them find jobs because we can give them a skill while they're inside the prison, but when they walk out, very few employers were willing to employ them. They said, no, not in my workplace, no, this guy has lots of tattoos, no. We can help them to become Christians. They go to chapel services, they become Christians, but when they walk out, very few churches were willing to accept them into the fold. We can help them with their anger management, but when they walk out, the family is not willing to forgive them. We can ask them to leave their gangs, but when they walk out, nobody there to become their friends. No, this is an ex-addict, this is an ex-gangster. We realize that society is locking them up all over again whenever they walk out of the prisons. It's a second prison, it's a psychological prison. So I was put in charge of this project. I was thinking, should I uh, just do an event? But God impressed upon me. We have to set society free, unlock the whole second prison. So with that, I started a national movement to unlock the second prison, which we have called... Um, so this is just a summary. Bringing kingdom vision. If thy kingdom come to society, if thy will be done in society, how would it look like? Will society be setting them free? Especially the church, who should be taking the lead? And that was how Yellow Ribbon Project was initiated. Actually, it's very interesting because... Um, where does even this yellow ribbon name came from? A lot of people ask me, well, Jason, you're so creative. You can you know, come up with this idea. You can conceptualize this. I say, of course, if they are Christian, I say, only God can do it. Humanly, it's so impossible. God is a creative God, and God will give the creative idea. It was in a karaoke uh, uh, room in the prison officers' club. I still remember a few months before this happened, um, uh, God seeded this idea of a yellow ribbon pro project. Some children, in fact, my children were there, they were singing the song, tie a yellow ribbon around the old tree. And I never knew the lyrics. I walked in and there was a younger prison officer, a junior prison officer walked in and uh, we were looking at the children singing. They were looking so happy, you know. Yeah, I, I, I remember having this conversation with this prison officer. I said, this is a very old song. You know, the children are singing, you know. It's, it's my generation, not their generation. And, and, and I remember this junior officer said, sir, do you know what this song is about. I look at him, I say, no, I think it's a happy song, right? If you listen to the song, it's quite a happy tune. He said, no, it's not a happy song. It's a very sad song. I said, what do you mean? He said, look at the lyrics. So I started to read the lyrics on the karaoke uh, screen. I said, wow, it's about prisoner coming home, looking for acceptance, looking for forgiveness. And, and, and this husband has written a letter to the wife and telling the wife that if I see a a yellow ribbon tied round the old oak tree in the town, I will come down the bus, that means you have forgiven me. But if I don't see the yellow ribbon, I'm going to continue my journey. Forget about us, put the blame on me. 
And I said, wow, that's powerful. And of course, he did not look out of the bus and he asked the driver to look out for, for him and the driver asked the passengers to look out for him and they saw hundreds of ribbons on the old oak tree. Every whole bus cheered, right? So that was what the lyric was, was about. So God used that to seed into my mind that, wow, let's start a yellow ribbon campaign, a yellow ribbon movement, a yellow ribbon project. And that was how it started. Now for your information, um, it's 10 years already. So this a few months ago, uh, I did it for two years, and, uh, but it's been 10, 10 years. And this is a commemorative uh, Yellow Ribbon Project 10th anniversary commemorative book. Everything is now documented inside. And in fact, recently, I think the, uh, the, the daughter of the king uh, from Thailand visited Singapore, uh, visited the Prime Minister wanting to learn about the Yellow Ribbon Project. So it has gone beyond Singapore. You know, when God wants to set prisoners free, it's not just for one nation, but God will spread it to other nations as well. Because of the change process, we can see, I was telling you that uh, in the early days, uh, prison population was going up, 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 hit about 17, 18,000, and that was when we were planning the largest prison complex in the world. It was supposed to all the way here. But thank God it didn't happen because the prisons transformed itself, society transformed itself. We unlocked the first prison, we unlocked the second prison. And it has now gone down. And it's now quite stable around here. Interestingly, as uh, around that, that time, it was around 2006, um, I just sensed that my season, my time in the prisons has come to an end. And as I sought the Lord, God opened the door for me to move to another government department. Uh, okay, before I talk about that, uh, as a result of the, uh, the, the, the declining prison population, all the good things that have happened, prisons won many awards. I will just mention one. You know, remember I told you when I first joined the service <laughs> many years ago, nobody wanted to join the prison service. But in recent years, it has become one of the top 10 companies to work for in Singapore. Uh, in fact, uh, the first time it was ranked, uh, it was the only government department, only civil service department that went into the top 10 companies. Uh, so the first Four Seasons Hotel, second Ritz Carlton Hotel, third uh, Raffles Hotel, fourth Singapore Marriott Hotel, um, that's, uh, fifth is McDonald's no, Hotel, sixth Shangri-La Hotel, seven is a private company, eight Singapore Prisons Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the difference between this hotel and all the other hotels, those are five, six stars hotel, the difference is that they want repeat customers. That's how they measure success. Singapore Prisons doesn't want repeat customers. That's how we measure success. Thank God, God has set many of them free so that they don't have to come back into the prisons. And as a result, as I was telling you, God, uh, my season was coming to an end. I started to ask God where he wanted me to go and uh, God moved me to another government department and that was how Debts for Life, another national movement was started. I will share with you. Now as you can see at the bottom left hand, when I moved over to this new uh, ministry, it's called Ministry of Social and Family Development, I was given this uh, portfolio as the Senior Director of Rehabilitation Protection Residential Services. That actually means all the children's homes in Singapore come under this division. Probation service, when young people get into trouble with the law, come under this division. Family violence, child abuse, spousal violence, homeless, destitutes, come under this division. You know, I thought I was moving upstream from prison. I thought I was moving upstream, you know, doing some upstream work. But when I was, took, I was given this portfolio, I had 600 staff under me. I said, I've, for the first time, I saw brokenness in Singapore that I never imagined can happen in a first world country. I know of children in coma in hospital because of being beaten up by the fathers. And I, I began to seek the Lord. I said, God, why are you allowing me to see again? Because remember I said, if God allows us to see, that means he has a solution. If he allows us to see, that means he has been seeing the same thing day in, day out, 24-7. And God is looking for a man, looking for a woman, looking for a group of people to to execute his solution, to execute his, his plan on earth. You know, thy kingdom come. If thy kingdom come, there shouldn't be so much family violence. If thy will be done, there shouldn't be so much dysfunctionality in the families. If we can solve these family issues, we can close down the rest of the prison. Wouldn't it be correct? Mm. And that's what God led me to do. Let me share with you what happened. Now, again, because it's God's solution, it's God's idea, um, it's not about how hard we work, it's not about how much resources we put in, it's how does God 
going to solve the problem. What is God's solution? It has to be, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means in heaven, there's already a solution. We just need to tap into heaven. We need to pray. We need to seek the Lord and hear from Him and it will come down to earth. <coughs> Let me share with you. So in 2007, June, I went over to this uh, government department for three months. <coughs> I was seeing all these problems in the families and I sought the Lord. And in September 2007, I went on this trip to Israel because I wanted to hear God. And I thought that maybe Jerusalem, Israel is God's headquarters. I would be closer to God <laughs> and I can hear God speak better because sometimes at work, it's, we are so busy, we don't have time to pray. And I took 10 days leave, I, I went. And you know, when we seek God with all our heart, He will be found. When we press in, God will draw near to us. And that was what happened. Let me show you what, uh, what, took, what took place. I had an encounter with God. I was at level three of the hotel where the conference was taking place. There were 120 Singaporeans from different churches in Singapore went on this trip. Um, this conference, there were three, 4,000 delegate members from 100 over nations. And Singapore has 120 delegates. And so I was one of those. And, uh, and within two days, God spoke to me. I was with two other Singaporeans, um, Christians. We were just chit-chatting and they were in, involved in the prison's work before. One of them was a pastor involved in the prison ministry. Another was a prison officer, but uh, he has uh, resigned. He went into the marketplace. So for three months, we have not met each other. So we decided to catch up during the conference. So we were talking, we were chit-chatting. And, and uh, towards the end, this uh, ex-prison officer told the pastor, why don't you pray for Jason? Jason has new minister, new colleagues, new, new, new portfolio. Why don't you pray for him? So he started to lay hands and he started to pray and all of a sudden, the presence of God came into that space. We were just sitting on the sofa at level three of the hotel. There were hotel rooms, something like that, the doors, you know. Uh, presence of God came upon me. I started trembling, I started shaking. I saw a vision. I was in the physical, I was also in the spiritual. Um, it was so vivid, I will always be able to remember. Uh, I went onto my knees, I could not even sit on my chair, and I saw God's hand raised up into the heavens, wanting to come down, and in the vision, right up there, I could sense God next to me looking down through the clouds. I saw Singapore, you know, Singapore is just a small little island of a diamond shape, and I saw the whole of Asia, uh, uh, Asia Pacific surrounding S Singapore. You know, that is why whenever, last two, three years, when there's someone invites me to go and share, I will say yes, because I remembered that that vision, something happened, and I saw the whole of Asia and Asia Pacific. So even like now, if I'm here in Australia, I believe it is something, maybe one of you will receive this and, 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 and hear it as if it is God speaking to you directly. And maybe this is something is for you as well. Uh, it has been seven years, so it's 2007, this is uh, 2014, it's been seven years already since this encounter. And so in that vision, I saw that, I saw God's hand came down in the vision, hit Singapore, and there was this ripple that went out. As it hit Singapore, I heard a loud roar of a lion, a huge roar. And it, there was this ripple that went out and shook the whole of Asia and Asia Pacific, it just went out. And, uh, and, and, and I started to pray, and God said, pray for the future of your country. I started to pray, uh, and after a while, I heard God say, the future is in the children. The future of the country is in the next generation. And I couldn't pray, because for the three months between June and September, the only children, the only young people that I was working with are those in bondage, are those uh, abused, are those who are uh, ju juvenile delinquents. I couldn't pray, because how can Singapore come into its destiny? How can the country be strong? if our children, if our young people are struggling. And I remember I was having this conversation with God and then I heard Jesus say, let the children come to me. Let the children come. It was a desperate cry of Jesus and I saw in the vision Jesus was snatching, snatching the children who were in bondage, snatching the young people and I could sense there were thousands and in the physical, I was on my knees. I remember I was also doing this because I heard God say, whatever you see in the spiritual, you do in the physical world, whatever you see in heaven, you do on earth. So I started doing this, snatching and snatching. I was trembling, shaking, I was tearing, crying. And uh, I could sense there were thousands. Uh, I could sense there were thousands of children surrounding Jesus and they were safe with Jesus. And at the same time, I could sense that Satan was coming, wanting to grab the children back again. But immediately, 
uh, Jesus came and, and I, I could sense that they were all safe with Jesus. And uh, I, could hear, heard, I could hear Jesus also say, I want to bless the children. Now, interestingly, at level three of the hotel, uh, there were some children, about three, four children. Some of the Singapore delegate members brought their children along. So they were just behind me. So I remember looking at the ex-prison officers, can you grab the children? Jesus wanted to bless the children. So they brought the three, four children and I started to lay hands on them. And they represented the thousands of children of the country. And Jesus was blessing them. And at the end of it, I heard God say, Jesus want to, I heard Jesus say, I want to wash their feet. I want to wash their feet. So I said, can you get me a bottle of water? So they got me a bottle of water, a piece of cloth. I, they put the first child on the chair. I poured water on the left foot, I remember, of the first child. Uh, he had crew cut hair, very short hair. And I held on to the foot. And I saw the child for the first time. I saw the child through Abba Father's eyes. You know, I love children. I've worked with children before. You know, I, I've been a volunteer and, and help out with some poor children before. And of course, uh, some years later, God gave me all the children's home in Singapore to look after. So God has a sense of humor. And, but this time when I saw this child, I saw the child through Abba Father's eyes. The only two words I could use to describe what I saw was, I kept repeating it again and again. So precious, so precious, so precious, so precious. You know what I saw? I saw destiny. I saw future. I saw purpose. It's God, it's, it's what, what God was telling me was that every child that he put into this world through a set of father and mother has a destiny, has a purpose. Even if earthly parents fail, God will not fail because God will call out that destiny. And after washing the four or five children's feet, I was exhausted. I sat there. I was thinking, is it over? And that was when I started, started to feel angry. I said, God, how come I feel so angry? Because earlier it was love, it was compassion, wanting to bless the children, wanting to wash the children's feet. But all of a sudden, there was this anger that was rising. I said, God, what, what do you want me to do now? And I heard God say, break the curse of abortion over Singapore. So in the vision, I still remember, my hand hit the nation of Singapore again. And uh, as God's hand was on the nation of Singapore and the surrounding regions, and I started to pray against the curse of abortion, the spread of abortion in Singapore. And in the vision, I could sense there were thousands, thousands. And I still remember now, at the time, I didn't know how many children were aborted in Singapore every year. But I could sense thousands. And God said, Satan has used adults to take the destiny of children away. When I came back to Singapore, one of the first things I did was to ask my colleagues to find out from the Ministry of Health or find out from wherever, what is the number of babies aborted every year? Singapore is not a big country, but we have every year 11,000 every year. So with that encounter for six months until April, I was doing whatever I could, uh, getting more resources, introduced new programs to save all these children. But I could sense in that three, six months that there was still something missing. It's like God still has something to tell me, but I do not know what yet. So I decided that I will go for another conference this time. Now, what happened was that the pastor in one of the speakers in the Israel conference was from Ukraine, Kiev. He has the largest church in Eastern Europe. So he was one of the speakers and he gathered the 120 Singaporeans and said, well, if you want, you can come and visit me because I have a conference in April next year. So I recorded, I took note, and because after six months, I still feel that God has something more to tell me, I decided to make a trip to Ukraine, not to see the largest church in Eastern Europe, but to hear God. And in Ukraine, during one of the worship sessions, I saw pieces of jigsaw puzzle. I saw teenage pregnancy. I, thought, I, I saw juvenile delinquencies. I, I, saw, I saw abortion. I, I, I saw uh, family violence, child abuse. I saw all this. I remember having this conversation with God. I said, God, I'm trying to do more here. I've done more here. I think I'm doing more here. Yeah, I still need to do more here. But what is the root of all this? What is the root? And all of a sudden, the words disappeared. One word left, and the word was fathers fathers and they began to connect the dots back to Israel this is a DVD that I bought in fact I bought a few DVDs the main theme for the Israel conference was releasing the Joshua generation in all nations it's about the next generation every speaker that came was talking about this release the Joshua generation the next generation nobody actually preached on the sub theme which was at the bottom of the banner uh, the, 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 the side of, of the brochures at the back of the DVDs the sub theme was he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their father. So when I saw the word father, I remembered the sub theme. I said, God, it's so true. If we can turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the land will not be cursed. Society will not have so many problems. There won't be child abuse. There won't be, be, be teenage pregnancies. And uh, 
as a result of the revelation, I said, God, that's it. You are going to turn hearts of fathers to the children. And it, interestingly, God spoke back to me and said, God said, no, not me. Go and read your Bible. <laughs> so I opened my Bible and I read, who is turning the hearts of the fathers to the children? 